Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dan Sweet with Helicopter Association International and welcome to HAI at Work. Today's webinar is Cultivating a Positive Safety Culture. So let's go ahead and get things rolling here, get my uh, screen sharing going. There we go. Uh, the topic today, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, safety culture. Uh, this is, is something that's been vital throughout our industry for many years. Um, for over the th past 30 years, uh, researchers have repeatedly demonstrated how a positive safety culture throughout a business or organization can influence behavior and, as a result, significantly increase safety performance. Um, one of the biggest challenges to fostering a positive safety culture occurs when an organization doesn't have a full understanding of what it takes to uh, establish a safety culture and how it can be cultivated, assessed, and maintained at all levels. Uh, so today we're uh, going to bring in Dr. Jason Stark, who is the Director of Safety and Product Development of Baldwin Safety and Compliance, and he helps companies implement a positive safety culture that can help reduce accidents and incidents. Uh, in fair disclosure, uh, Baldwin uh, Safety and Compliance is a partner organization of HAI, and we work with uh, Baldwin uh, quite a bit on some of our safety products. Uh, they are subject matter experts. Uh, today's speaker, Dr. Jason Stark, uh, is a Director of Safety and Product Development for Baldwin. Um, he recently completed his doctorate at in organizational leadership at North Central University. Prior to working at Baldwin, he served as an Operations Manager for the International Business Aviation Council, or IBAC. He joined IBAC from Universal Weather and Aviation, where he led efforts to develop a safety management system software and classroom training solution for various flight departments. Our webinars are interactive. We do encourage you to ask questions. Dr. Stark um, is happy to take uh, questions at the end of our webinar. Um, we do ask that you use the question module uh, here in Zoom, whether it's uh, either on the side or the bottom or somewhere on your menu system, depending on what you're using to watch this. The chat feature is open if you want to talk among the other attendees that are uh, present. But um, we do uh, you know, encourage you to use the question module as much as possible for that section of it. Our webinars are being recorded. We will make that recording available uh, both on our YouTube channel and on our website as quickly as possible. Usually it's the following afternoon, but sometimes depending on how things uh, render, it can take uh, into the following week. So we'll get that up as fast as we can. So now let's go ahead and wrap up that part of it and invite uh, Dr. Stark. Uh, Jason, please join us. Hey there. Thank you, Dan. Absolutely, Jason. Thank you for joining us today. So of course. Let's, let's start out with the easy question. When is the, the right time to start developing safety culture? Oh, boy. That, that, that's actually a great question. But when we look at the organizational level, uh, we always say right, right at the beginning. I mean, right when we start the organization, that is the best time to be cognizant of what safety culture is and how to influence and cultivate a positive safety culture. As far as understanding the importance of safety culture, I would say even in flight school. I mean, when we go back there in flight school and uh, we can understand what it looks like, what we, what we can expect, the outcome of one, I think would be a great place to start looking. Sounds good. Okay, well, I'll uh, mute my camera and let you get rolling with your presentation. We appreciate your being here today. Of course, it's my honor. Thank you. All right, let me share this, guys and gals. And everything look good on your side, Dan? Yeah, it looks good, uh, Jason. Thanks. All right, fantastic. Thank you for that. So, uh, as Dan said, this the, the the presentation is cultivating safety culture. And I know some of you in the back of your mind may be thinking, oh, gosh, another another thing on safety culture. And it is talked about a lot, and we'll get into that. But I, I think what we want to understand is the importance of safety culture in the organization and basically how we can really look at uh, fostering a positive safety culture. So the importance, the importance for safety culture, I don't believe can be um, overstated at all. I mean, it is it is something that is absolutely critical for safety performance of an organization. In fact, as we'll see here in a minute, uh, safety culture is widely researched in academia, and they have constantly linked a strong or robust safety culture 
with safety performance in not only aviation organizations, but many other segments as well, as we will see here in a minute. But it has always been known to be a precursor, if you will, to, to reduced accidents, reduced incidents, and overall strong safety performance of an organization. So it, it's really important. And, and I think one of the one of the best things, if we're going to put this into context of a safety management system, which we're all really familiar about, and don't worry, I'm not going to get into SMS overly, overly deep today. But we, when we put it in the context of safety management, one of the best ways I've heard it put is that the safety culture is the atmosphere in which your safety management system will live and breathe. So if your culture is weak or toxic, um, in terms of in terms of safety culture, then your safety management system will fail. I mean, it's guaranteed it will fail. However, on the other side, if your culture is very robust and strong, then your safety management system will thrive. And so it, it shows the importance of this idea of safety culture when it comes to safety management and overall safety performance of your organization. And like I said, it's been linked to a robust safety management system. So there, there, there has been uh, some research on this, but it, it's kind of a feedback mechanism between the two. We've seen where a strong safety culture has helped uh, develop strong safety management systems, robust safety management systems. And likewise, the implementation of safety management systems has also had a very positive effect on the safety culture. So the two, we, we can't really say that one causes the other, but we've seen kind of a feedback between the two of them. So for those organizations, when you when you are implementing safety management, and of course there's some caveats, you know, as far as leadership and leadership being involved, but when you're implementing a safety management system, have have the the um, awareness of the positive effect that it can also have on your safety culture. But on the flip side, it's really good to understand your safety culture prior to uh, implementing the safety management system so we can see how successful it will be. And then one of the other knowns about safety culture that I've seen is that there seems to be a lot of uncertainty about what safety culture is exactly. And hopefully we're gonna dive into that just a little bit. But when, when we're uncertain about this notion of what safety culture is, um, then sometimes we we don't we don't really approach what we don't understand, and with how important it is to understand and to approach and measure safety culture, it's it, we really need to be aware of what it is. So diving into that, um, <clears throat> we're going to first talk a little bit about where this idea of safety culture came from. So. It's interesting, and some of you that are uh, more on the seasoned end, like me, uh, i.e. old, der, the, this, the idea of safety culture first happened, um, was first mentioned in 1986 with the Chernobyl accident. And this, this uh, some of you may remember it, is a, a devastating accident that, that impacted hundreds of thousands of people. And um, still, its impacts are felt today, as, as we've known from the recent conflict. But the, it was first introduced in that report that it cited a lack of a culture of safety contributing to the meltdown. So what they found is that there was this lack of predisposition towards being safe that led to that led to the errors, the operators, which led led to the meltdown. But when it comes into our industry, we first saw it. Uh, uh, we first saw it creep into the reports back in uh, 1991 with the crash of Continental Express 2574. Some of you may remember that it was in Eagle Lake, Texas, just outside of Dallas. But um, it, it happened on the uh, September 11th, 1991, and Dr. John Lauber actually uh, quoted or documented this fact of a lack of safety culture, specifically also maintenance and, and the maintenance problems that contributed to that uh, accident um, being uh, causal, if you will, or part of the part of the causal chain into why that accident happened. So we saw it creep into the aviation industry. And since then, we, we have seen a lot of reference to safety culture, and especially in some of the more high profile uh, fixed wing and rotor wing accidents that, that we've seen out there. <clears throat> And as I mentioned in the introduction, there has been a lot of research, uh, especially in the last 30 years. So as you can imagine, since the Chernobyl mentioning, and then um, obviously too with the with the Eagle Lake, when when we started talking about safety culture, it became a hot topic 
and the academic side of things. So they want to say, okay, well, obviously we're linking safety culture to lives being lost and, and loosely. Um, we need to study this thing to understand how we can cultivate it in an organization and what it looks like, what, what it means to the organization and how the organization can cultivate that. So um, like I said, through all research, uh, I, I can't think of a, a paper that we've read where uh, safe, uh, a safety, a strong safety culture was not linked to a safe working environment. So I, I kind of feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but um, but it is it is has been proven time and time again, at least in research, that this notion of a strong safety culture, which we're going to talk about what that notion is here in a minute, uh, being linked to a very strong uh, or safe working environment, as it was. And obviously, we we. Um, when, when we look at, some of you may have read James Reason, but this notion of an organizational accident, even in his writings, he has talked about how safety culture has been a factor when we look at these large scale organizational accidents like Chernobyl, the Eagle Lake accident, um, and some of the other high profile accidents that we see. So uh, we're gonna look at some definition and traits of safety culture, but I, I think one of the interesting things about safety culture is that it's sometimes viewed as standalone. So it, when we look at an organization, sometimes we just see it having a safety culture. And I'm not saying that that's wrong, but when actually, when actuality though, safety culture in a lot of the research is described as a trait, if you will, of the organizational culture. And it's, 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 less, it's less its own standalone thing, so to speak, rather than something that is part of the organizational culture. And, and that's what makes it so challenging. So uh, an organizational culture being a general term, and I don't want to take away too much from what we be getting into, but an organizational culture as a general thing is, you know, what, what the organization has a disposition towards. And so you can have an organization that has an entrepreneurial culture, you can have an organization that has a strong production culture, you have an organization that maybe has a strong you know, team culture, but you have these different cultures that an organization can have. And we'll see why, like I said, in a minute. And then you, you have an organization's disposition towards safety, if you will, as part of its culture. So we call it safety culture, right? But it, it, it's a trait of the overall culture of the organization. And, and the interesting thing about that, though, is that an organization, these traits can actually compete against each other. Which, which makes for interesting scenarios. So, so if you think about it, that an organization is a really has a very go get them profit driven culture, that they're out there, they're, they're getting the job done, they're getting the mission done, wanting to uh, please their, their customers. How is that, how is that going to stand next to the safety culture? And, and obviously we get into that argument about the, the, um, the, the, the paradigm of the two P's or I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the dilemma of the two Ps, as it's been called, production versus protection, but the, these different cultures can compete with each other. So it, it's it's something we got to say that it doesn't stand alone, that an organization is not just going to have a safety culture, I think you know that, but it's going to have this safety as one of the dispositions that an organizational culture can have. And another thing that I find interesting too, is that a lot of times it's regarded as something that could be bought, implemented, and installed. So, and, and I know I said it earlier, but... Uh, this notion of implementing a safety culture isn't actually 100% correct. Neither is it, I've, I've heard uh, I've heard an organization say, well, I gotta go get me a safety culture. Well, it's not something you can buy off Amazon, okay? So it's not something that could be bought um, and necessarily something that could be implemented or installed, but every single organization has a safety culture. So that means every single organizational culture has some disposition towards safety. Now, some of these organizations, they can have a negative disposition to safety where like, no, safety is not our thing. We're just going to get the job done. You know, safety takes a back seat to everything. Um, you know, we, we saw that in the, that was kind of the attitude of, I can't remember the individual's name, but with the sub incident that was going down to see the Titanic, you know, safety is like, that's yeah, overrated. That, that's kind of a negative attitude towards safety. So that would be a negative safety culture. We have a neutral safety culture where we see some organizations, you know, they just really don't think about it. It's, you know, I'll try to be safe, but, um, you know, it's not really in the forefront. And then we have organizations with a positive safety culture, which is what we're wanting to be, especially being in high risk, a high risk industry. We want to have a very strong, 
positive shared values about safety and mitigating risk in the organization. So, so saying that a culture can be bought or implemented or installed isn't really accurate. Uh, what we want to do is foster a positive safety culture within the organization. So um, like I said, the, the safety culture is actually an attribute or a trait of organizational culture. And we're looking at what an organizational culture is. And, and obviously, you know, we can go on for hours about this and don't have the time for that. But an organizational culture, we look at it as these underlying norms and ideals. So it's like, what, what, what are our, these things that are taken for granted what are those about safety? And I, and I know I'm not conveying it right because it's such an ethereal idea that it's just this kind of this underlying ethos about, about safety in this case or about, about anything uh, when we talk about organizational culture. And, and one of the things that I, I find fascinating about organizational culture, and uh, uh, Edgar Schein, or Schein um, talked about this in his book too and in some of his research, but these underlying norms and ideals about anything, and I know we're talking about safety, really start with the founders of an organization. And it starts with the leadership, the founders of the organization, and it kind of permeates from there uh, and persists through the years. So we see, you know, we see when NASA was first, um, when NASA was first created and what the problems it had to deal with and the challenges it had, that really did a lot shaping its culture early on. And we see some of those traits that culture is still living on today. But Getting back to this, so so organizational culture it has this like underlying um, this underlying values, if you will, or these underlying ideals about safety, which then translate into the values that the organizational members have about safety. So how the organization feels at the deepest levels about safety translates into the values that the employees have about safety, which then ends up into the artifacts, and the artifacts themselves are what we see in the day to day. So if you if you walked into a hangar, for example, and you see the chief of maintenance smoking a cigarette right next to a fuel vent, I think you got a pretty good idea. That's the artifact. That's you're seeing the manifestation. I think you got a pretty good idea of what their values, their shared values and ideals about safety are. You know, I know that's just one example, but you kind of get a sense of that. So so what you're seeing in the everyday really reflects what your shared values um, and ideals about safety are. Now, uh, another thing too is that, and this can be a good thing, but culture can also be affected by national and professional culture. So we, we've seen instances where a national culture, especially when it comes to things like power distance or how people feel about authority, um, how that can affect safety culture, as well as our professional culture. And we as, as, as pilots or aircraft operators, again, working in high-risk organizations, high-risk industry, um, we take our profession very seriously. So the, the comforting fact about that is even in organizations that may have a, a weak or negative safety culture, sometimes professional culture uh, works against that to, to help keep uh, operations safe. So the way, the way it comes out, um, I, I guess one of the, the easiest definitions of safety culture because if you if you were to google safety culture definition you, you'd find so many things um and one of the best and shortest ways to say it are shared values norms and behaviors around safety i mean that that's basically what it comes in and i think the big one there or or the the two the two big words there are shared so that's the first word is shared so it's something culture is something that is shared it's something that all the employees share and it's what's in in instilled in them is, is the values. So the values that they have about safety that are shared. And we'll talk in a little bit about where that comes from. But this idea that safety, uh, safety culture starts with what's shared amongst the employees is, is very important, especially these shared values. And the shared values themselves will actually will actually manifest, like we said, like we did said with the artifacts, it will actually manifest into the behavior especially around safety that you see day to day in the organization. Now, when it comes to safety culture, because, because we said that these deeper values actually manifest in the artifacts, which is the everyday operations, how we see people working, how we see the organization act, what the organization is doing about safety. Safety culture is very experiential, meaning that it's how it's perceived. And, and this is what's important when it comes to measuring 
but safety culture because because of the fact that it's something it, it's something that's perceptual so it's something that how the employees see what's happening and how they interpret what's happening in the organization and and the interesting thing is that uh, safety culture itself can also vary by organization. So you can have two organizations right next to each other, obviously, and, and I know I'm not stating something that you guys don't already know, but you can have organizations that, uh, organization X, organization Y, right next to each other, even on the same field, they can have widely different safety cultures. And safety cultures can also vary by industry. So we look at industry-wide, industry-wide, um, industry-wide, uh, metrics, which we'll we'll see those later, but depending on the industry, like Part One Thirty Five versus Part Ninety One versus helicopter air ambulance, the safety culture can vary widely across those industries as well. So there's a lot to safety culture, and a lot of that's that perception. And a lot of things can skew that perception. Maybe like work life balance, quality of life, uh, job satisfaction. Those things can also work to skew safety culture and how it's perceived by the employee. But it's very interesting to see that it can vary so greatly in in the different industries. And then finally, getting into the the smallest, the micro uh, field here, it can vary within the organization. And we see this a lot uh, when we look at safety culture. We see this a lot more in larger organizations. So the organiz the the safety culture when we look at people's perception of of what the organization is doing about safety, how they see people act with safety. It can vary by different departments. So you, you got kind of these microcultures. And what we're seeing, and I want to touch on this now, is that a lot of this can be due to a lack of leadership, um, especially a strong leading anchor within the organization. So especially in bigger organizations. But when you have a big organization and you have a lot of layers between your cultural anchor, which should be your highest level of leadership or your leadership team, and then the frontline worker, when there's a lot of levels there, we see sometimes that in those levels, you can have weaker leaders or a leader that's absent and who isn't towing the line in terms of what the shared values and norms are in the organization. And the scary thing about that is if there's a lack of leadership, if there is a void in the leadership, nature abhors a vacuum. So that void needs to be filled and it could be filled by some other garbage other than the, the shared values and norms around safety within the organization. So, so one thing to think about when we're cultivating this kind of the first, there's the first point here, but one thing to think about when we're cultivating um, a safety culture in an organization, particularly larger organizations, is that we need to make sure that all levels of leadership from the top down to the front line are on the same page in terms of the shared values and norms when it comes to safety within the organization. Now, smaller organizations being a little bit more agile, being closer to the, uh, the leadership, assuming that you have a strong uh, anchor in leadership, specifically safety leadership, it, it's, not, it's not as big of a problem as what we're finding. We're finding uh, less variance in the culture within an organization. So, and then one other thing about uh, safety culture um, is that it should be measured periodically. Obviously, that, that's important because a lot of things can impact safety culture. We can see, you know, you, you can have uh, leadership change, you can have mergers, which are big safety culture changers. So you want to you want to measure your safety culture just to, just to get an idea of where it's at and um, possibly where it's going. But it, it's been said that uh, when we talk about leading and lagging metrics, you've probably heard that before. Leading or lagging indicators, safety culture is a very good leading indicator, which I kind of touched on at the beginning of this presentation of the safety performance within the organization. So if we have a good sense of the safety culture, the robustness, the strength of the safety culture within the organization, it kind of speaks to, it speaks to what we can expect in safety performance. It doesn't guarantee it, but it does speak to it. This is the graph that I want to show, <laughs> excuse me. It's very interesting, actually. You look at it um, up here, uh, this tells about the number of participants and you can see that this, this is a safety culture score. So this is how people are perceiving safety culture in this given organization. But the point, what I wanna point out is that this is one single organization. And we have responses ranging from 1.9 to five. And this, this is the frontline workers, this isn't management. But you can see that there is this wide variance, if you will, in one single organization. And this, this is really telling because remember, again, this is how this is people's perception. We're asking them questions about how they perceive 
the organizational stance on safety, how the behavior is in safety. Again, the artifacts, uh, that's that's the only thing we can see because we can't really stick a thermometer into the deeper values of the organization. So we kind of got to measure from what's being perceived. And you can see in this given organization that it runs the gamut, like I said, you know, over almost four points, you know, 3.2 points. So it's it's it can vary greatly within an organization. Now, on that other note, on smaller organizations, we will see this graph a lot tighter, usually peaking about 4.8 and going down into maybe 4.5, 4.4. So there's a lot less variance uh, in a in a smaller organization than we see in a large organization. So um, let's let's talk about safety culture in different industries and the positive impact it has. Uh, and I'll just do this fairly quickly, but uh, when, when we look at different industries and the impact of safety culture in construction, um, research has found that workers, when they perceive, again, there's that word, when they perceive a positive safety culture, which generally, which generally translates into the organization being proactive about safety and having strong shared values about safety, safety performance is enhanced and the likelihood of accidents decreases. This was, search, uh, this was uh, research done by this individual back in 2021. Healthcare, which a lot of people have considered the sister industry of aviation, or maybe we're the sister industry of healthcare, who knows how it goes, but um, a, a positive safety culture has been linked to greater compliance with patient safety protocols and enhance patient safety and care. And you can read that just as well as I did. But what this tells me too is now we're seeing an element of safety culture instilling a sense of compliance with safety protocols within the organization. And that's what we want. I mean, we take the time uh, through risk controls, which a lot of the, the operating procedures and the restrictions that we see, there, a lot of them are risk controls, we see that a, a stronger safety culture, as also shown in this study, is related to greater compliance or better compliance, I should say, and less deviations from, uh, from standards and regulations. Also, maritime boating, which we get a lot of our traditions in aviation from, but a positive safety culture was linked to greater compliance with safety procedures. There we see it again, uh, greater compliance. Reduced overall risk, reduced accidents, and lower insurance premiums. Now, it's that last one that you should see dollar signs. This is where we start quantifying it in terms of something pragmatic and what ends up in the old wallet. So, But other things to touch on here, too. Again, we see that compliance, safety culture being uh, related to compliance with safety procedures. But that idea of reduced overall risk. And it's, this, again, this idea that since we have shared values about safety, one of the one of the descriptors of a very strong safety culture has been generative. That goes back to Dr. Hudson's uh, levels of safety culture maturity. But when you have this idea of a generative culture, a generative safety culture, a very strong uh, shared values on safety, the way it's been described is that it's an almost uneasiness about safety. Like, where's the next thing going to happen? Where's the next thing going to go wrong? And they're, that's always in the forefront of their mind. So they're, they're taking in all this information. They're, they're looking, they're inspecting, they're doing whatever to find out where the next problem could possibly be. They're almost uneasy about it. And when they find it, then they actively reduce the, the probability of a bad outcome uh, with that. And that's what we're talking about, reduced overall risk. And that's how safety culture plays into this idea of reduced overall risk, which would then um, play into this idea of reduced accidents. Oil and gas industry, big down here in Houston. Uh, again, another link, a positive safety culture was linked to increased driving performance. So now we get into another pragmatic, we're, we're in a sense driving, right? But we call it flying, but we're in a sense driving, but our performance increases. Uh, being more cognizant of safety, being more risk-based thinking, safety culture, when we have that strong sense of safety, that shared values of safety passed in the organization, it also helps instill risk-based thinking in individuals. So when we're out there operating our helicopters, operating our aircraft, um, we, or we can see that our performance increases or improves because we start instilling risk-based thinking into our operations. But one of the things, let, let's go back to practicalness is this ancillary benefit of safety culture. So we've been talking all the safety. I, I kind of want to get out of the realm of safety here for a minute. And I want to put, uh, put this research into another practical sense in that a positive safety culture has been linked, strongly linked 
through a reduction in worker absenteeism. So when we look at worker absenteeism, them being disengaged from their work, them being not even present, not necessarily physically, but mentally, that uh, with a strong safety culture, what we've seen is that worker absenteeism has been less. So now with, a, let's, let's take the flip of that, with a strong safety culture, now we're seeing better engagement with, um, with the organization and with what the organization is doing. And other research, I don't have it on here, has also showed that a strong safety culture has been linked to organizational commitment. And organizational commitment is this idea, especially when we look at affective commitment, but organizational commitment is the idea that you love your organization. And we've seen that safety culture has been linked to more organizational commitment, I guess is the best way to say it. So more people loving their organization and maybe love's a strong word, but really respecting and being attached to their organization with a stronger safety culture. And why not? Because when we have that strong, perce when we have that per uh, perception of strong or shared values uh, and beliefs around safety, what that's also telling workers is that the organization cares about me. And so therefore I'm going to care about the organization. And then finally, um, there's a positive safety culture is linked to eliminating preventable errors. Uh, improve safety performance. And my favorite, going back to Amy Edmondson, is this idea of enhanced psychological safety. And what that's saying is that with a with strong safety culture, strong positive safety culture has been linked to environments, organizational environments where people feel safe to speak up. And that makes complete sense. So if there are strong norms and values around safety, people feel safer to speak up with things related to safety. So if they see something that's not right, something that's out of place, they feel more comfortable in speaking up and saying so. So some of the challenges in uh, fostering a positive safety culture. So this is where we're gonna get into the nuts and bolts and practical. So, so some of the challenges is, uh, well, first of all, is this idea of implementing a safety culture. And why I put that as a challenge is because, again, you're not necessarily implementing. So it's like programs and processes you implement, right? Safety culture is not a process or a campaign or a policy. It is something you have to foster. It is something that you have to nurture, something that you have to enhance. So we have to get out of this, this really restricted idea that safety culture is, I can just stick it in there and implement it. That's not the case. We, we have to work at it. So what looks at like a one-time project, fostering a safety culture is something that is continuous. And I know it sounds exhausting, but believe me, once it gets going, it really kind of gets onto autopilot and it kind of feeds on itself. So like I said, implementation, uh, fostering is more along the lines of nurturing, excuse me. Uh, one of the other challenges that we see in fostering a, uh, a safety culture is cultural inertia. And I know a lot of us have faced this. Um, I faced it. I've talked to a lot of individuals that faced it. You may be looking at your organization uh, and like, yeah, we can never have a strong safety culture because of X, Y, or Z. That cultural inertia is that resistance um, that the organization's culture puts on change efforts. So we're, we're comfortable. We've always done it this way. It's probably one of the biggest things that I've seen. And Fostering a safety culture, things will have to change, obviously. Um, we'll have to look at the way we're operating. We'll have to look at, you know, we'll have to look at how we feel about safety. And if we have a strong cultural tides against that, that's going to make that change very hard. Another thing, too, as we talked about earlier, is that you can have competing cultures. And if it looks like safety culture may encroach on one of those valued cultures that the organization has, such as like an entrepreneurial spirit, thinking that, oh, safety is really going to be a killjoy to that, that could also be cultural inertia. So we need to be aware of that. But that is one thing uh, that can really hamper um, uh, the uh, cultural the cultural uh, shift in the, in the organization. So uh, these cultural barriers, uh, like I said, uh, could be due to deep seated beliefs on how things are done or should be done. And that's, like I said, that's probably one of the biggest barriers that we see in, in terms of inertia are these deep seated beliefs. And what's funny is that these beliefs uh, may be folklore at the higher, but they become beliefs down at the front line. So it's that front line sometimes when we have these deep-seated beliefs that are the hardest to really hit or impact when it comes to uh, safety culture uh, change. But one of the big things, too, 
And I touched on this earlier, but one of the big things also that is a barrier to enhancing a safety culture or fostering a safety culture in the organization is insufficient leadership presence and effectiveness. So if you do not have, if you do not have that leader who can be the change agent, uh, if you don't have that leader that can set the stage or set the norms for what safety means to the organization and what the expected behaviors are around those values, then this can be very difficult to implement culture if they're not there or they're apathetic or they don't care. What's worse is if they're contra safety. So if you have a leader that doesn't believe in this stuff, but feels that a safety culture needs to be fostered to look good on paper or whatever, um, that's going to be a fool's errand. So insufficient leadership presence and effectiveness or a negative leadership presence is something that can really can really uh, impact culture. And one of the biggest things I, I get asked is, well, what do we do <laughs> if we have a leader like a CEO or a, a president or whatever, that's completely against safety. And it's a tongue in cheek response, but I say leave. Now it doesn't have to be that drastic. Now when leadership, and this isn't the venue to talk about leadership, but when leadership, leadership's about influence, not about position. And there have been times where you can lead up. So I, I would advocate for that, but sometimes some leaders are just so dead set against safety that you have to say, you know what, you know, maybe this isn't for me but a discussion for another time. And then, like I said, uh, the, another cultural barrier are those strong traditions, especially at the individual level, down at the front line. Um, when, you, when, you have, when you have operators, pilots, mechanics, uh, line service, whatever, when, you have, when they have very strong traditions and if, if fostering a positive safety culture, including the associated behaviors goes against those traditions or may diminish or dilute those traditions, then what we see is um, what we see is resistance, resistance in there because we 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 really want to hold it on to our traditions because that sometimes that helps us make sense of things in in terms of sense making. So that's another one of those barriers that we need to be aware of. So um, the role of leadership is again I'm, I'm going to touch on this briefly, but the role of leadership in overcome cultural inertia is key. So those things that we talked about, the traditions, the way we do things around here. Um, competing cultures, leadership is actually key in overcoming that. And again, you know, if, if we don't have effective leaders, what I want to talk to is all leaders, not just positional leaders, but you, you as safety leaders, you having the ability to influence. Now, some of these points are going to be probably related to positional, but I want you to also put this in the context of what you can do as a safety leader in the organization. Now, when we talk about need, uh, leaders are needed to provide resources, obviously who's writing the checks. And if it is that top leader, we're, we're going to need him or her. I mean, there, there's no doubt about it. If we need resources to help instill a, or um, foster a strong safety culture within the organization, um, we're gonna need that person, okay? And if we don't have that person, if we can't get the resources, if we can't be creative about it, it's gonna be problematic. Now, leadership, again, is going to be needed to overcome strong resistance. So when we talk about those cultural tides that may be going against uh, fostering a positive safety culture in the organization, leadership's needed. Now, again, through our own, our own leadership ability, through our own ability to influence from our heart of what we want to do with safety, we can, we can and have seen it done overcome resistance. We can. It's easier, though, if you have the top dog saying, you're on this train or you're off this train. That's a lot easier, but we can do it from our position as a safety leader, as an individual in the organization, not necessarily a positional leader, but as a safety leader through our influence, we're able to do that. And then communicate. Communication is so important, especially when we're trying to foster a strong safety culture in the organization. We can't say, okay, this is what we want to do. We want to foster a strong safety culture, and that's it. <laughs> you don't hear anything, crickets, for like the next two, three, four months. No, we have to keep communicating this message. This is where we want to go. We have to keep reminding people. In fact, when we, when we look at change management, and by the way, fostering a strong culture 
a strong safety culture, if we don't have one or if we want to improve it, that is a change, theoretically, right? We're changing from where we are to where we want to be. And most change management efforts fail, and this goes to any change management, whether it's adding a new aircraft, whether it's adding new SOPs or bringing on another business, where they fail most often is the lack of communication. So if we're not communicating that change, if we're not putting communication richly, strongly, frequently, then we create more problems than we really need to have. So communicate, communicate, communicate. And then in terms of leadership, this goes along with communication, but leadership needs to be present. Whether it's you acting as the influencer or it's your top leadership, they have to have a presence. Now, I know uh, in in our contemporary uh, organizations that that this idea of laissez-faire leadership has become kind of popular. You know, like, hey, you know, I'm the leader, but just do what you want. And, you know, unless something happens, I won't, I won't interfere. Well, unfortunately, what we see is that doesn't work well with, with instilling or fostering a strong safety culture. The leader has to be present and exhibiting that behavior, communicating that behavior, communicating expectations, and being a good example because leaders are watched. And that's a scary thing because as a leader, if you ever do anything that's against where you're trying to go with your organization, that's going to send a strong message and reduce trust. So leadership presence is absolutely important. So really quickly, just the need for safety culture services. Um, we talked about fostering a safety culture. We talked about some of the barriers to uh, uh, fostering a positive safety culture. Now, how can we get help? Now, I'm not advocating for spending money here um, at, at all. I mean, this is something that can absolutely be done, you know, with the right with the right leaders, with the right attitude and beliefs. This is something that can be done within the organization, but sometimes it's nice to get outside eyes uh, that, that can help you out a little bit. So I want to take it from that perspective, not that saying, oh, you got to go get a consultant. No, no, you don't. Um, but sometimes outside eyes can help because uh, they can help identify cultural barriers through surveys, through interviews. They can help identify and illuminate those cultural barriers. And sometimes when leaders or the people who are part of the cultural barrier, sometimes if it's brought to their attention, that's worth its weight in gold. And they see, oh, wow, I didn't I didn't realize that, that, you know, these traditions we have at the front line, that they're actually not being productive in terms of fostering a safety culture. That thing happens all the time, but sometimes that revelation is very, very effective. So um, a lot of that can help through. So if you identify those barriers, coaching individuals, um, coaching, not like CrossFit coaching or soccer coaching, but coaching them like as a personal coach, like listening to them, listening to their concerns and understanding their concerns, they, you can help overcome those, that cultural inertia. And then um, one of the other things too, which we're getting in this in this uh, in this presentation, but sometimes these outside services can help provide evidence-based facts around the benefits of fostering a positive safety culture. Now you can do that too. You can go research it, um, but sometimes these outside services can bring in research from their own services and, and give case analysis or case studies about what has done. Uh, one of the other positive things about safety culture services is a lot of times there's a lot of difficulty in measuring and assessing safety culture. And that's not uncommon because one, I mean, safety culture is kind of hard to understand. So how do you measure something we don't really understand? Uh, so so it's hard to construct an instrument for that or, or a survey. You know, it's not like we can take some kind of gauge and stick it into the middle of the organization and say, bing, there's our safety culture. It, it, so, so it's kind of hard to develop an instrument. And a lot of these outside safety culture services, they developed instruments that have been proven either in research or in actual real trials or real, real use. Um, and... And one of the benefits of that too is they they generally use an instrument that persists. So if you if you go um, and this this is something you can do internally as well. But if you measure using a certain survey, for example, make sure you kind of stick with that survey as you go along because if you start changing things, as you're going to start you're going to start changing the meaning, or you're going to start changing um, you're going to start changing the results as you are. You're going you're going to skew the data as it's called. And then one of the other benefits of outside sources is the objectivity. So they're, you know, internally, and we've seen this, um, and, and not saying it, it's a horrible thing, but internally there can be sometimes a reticence to give the real report uh, just for fear of retribution, which probably right there speaks a lot to the culture. But um, when you get an outside service, it's, it's easier to say, you know what, this is what they found. Uh, don't shoot the messenger. And, and what these outside services can do is they can present the facts 
um, impartially and non-biased. And, and that's what ideally you want. You, you don't want emotion with it. You don't want like, you know, I told you this place sucks. That's what you don't want. You just want objective and um, non-biased results. So you don't have to worry about anybody's feelings being hurt or them taking retribution. Now, I, I know a lot of that that I said um, was, again, in the context of an outside service, but I also want you to take those points to heart as well, doing it internally, because again, this is all stuff you can do internally. The real benefit that comes to having an outside service are one, the real benefits, I'll say two, uh, there's one is those fresh eyes and two is that, the two, that objectivity. So, but the rest of those points I want you to take to heart when you're considering or if you're considering doing this internally. So one of the other benefits um, uh, that is hard for an organization to do if you're doing it internally, but one of the benefits that an outside external service can do is this idea of benchmarking. And this is this goes back to our benchmarking at Baldwin, but you can see that we can benchmark safety culture scores by uh, different organization types and sizes. So what that does is allow your organization to answer the question, well, where do I sit amongst all the other different organizations of my type and my size? And then another thing uh, that outside services do well too, that can help illuminate in the organization, this is something that you can do internally as well, is this idea of safety culture by the different roles or departments in the organization. Remember we talked about, it, it can vary by role. And in this case, this actually comes from a, a case study a real case, but we found that um, this role F here had a significantly, statistically speaking, lower safety culture score than the rest of the other scores in the organization. So it allowed the organization to say, okay, well, let's focus on role F here and see what's going on. You know, is it something with leadership? Is it, what, what, why are they perceiving the behaviors and the organizational attitude towards safety a lot weaker than all the other different departments in the organization. And as such, they, they researched it and they, they were able to determine problems and, and, re, and re remediate those. So that's something that you can also do internally, but safety culture services generally do as well. And then um, giving back to the industry is a big thing that we see all safety culture services doing, all, you know, for most consultants doing is this idea that, okay, well, here, here's what it looks like across the different segments that we service. And they give this back to the industry and this presents awareness. And this is actually real data from 2021 to present, again, on the service Baldwin does. And what we found, interestingly, is that air medicals, specifically Rotocraft air medicals, overall safety culture score is significantly, statistically speaking, less than private and commercial. So it's it's something that, okay, well, why is that? And again, it, it, it could be many factors. We, we can't prove causality. We can say, okay, well, maybe it's related to uh, quality of life. Maybe it's related to job satisfaction. I, I don't know, but it's just interesting to say, okay, well, this, this segment may need a little bit of attention. So real briefly, this is not an advertisement, but um, Baldwin does have a safety culture service. Now, the last thing I want to do is say that we're not a we're not a service. We're going to come in and say everything's horrible and you need to hire us to fix it. No, we don't do that. We just we just give you the results and give you recommendations and you go on with it. We use a 28 question uh, survey and um, we also allow for open ended comments. So, again, if you're doing your own survey, those open ended comments are gold. So make sure that you include those as well, because what those open-ended comments do is they support the scores and they support why some people answered the way that they did. Um, we we use a we use um, when we look at safety culture, we look we don't look at safety culture as just one thing. We look at safety culture as having ingredients. So like safety leadership, reporting environment, uh, truth or trust and accountability. Uh, you know, um, learning ability. So these are some of the ingredients that we use in safety culture. And what that allows us to do, and this would be a good practice for you as well, is to hone in on, on certain aspects of safety culture, uh, on, on the ingredients to help you develop a stronger safety culture. So for example, if you had a reporting uh, dimension, as it's called, in your safety culture model, and you, you got the results back in your organization and say, oh, wow, the reporting the reporting, um, that reporting score is really low. And you can look at what questions you have, but you say, okay, well, maybe we can focus on, you know, more transparency, more feedback, whatever it may be to increase that, which would then obviously increase your overall 
safety culture score. And like I said, it's, it's kind of like ingredients in a cake. You have the cake, which might be like the safety culture, and then you have your ingredients. And you take a bite of that cake, it's like, wow, there's too much salt in there. Next time, you know, we, we need to remove some of that salt or, oh, wow, there's not enough sugar. And so you know to put more sugar in. And that's the whole idea of having these different dimensions within our safety culture. And like I said, it allows us to home in on weaker aspects so that we can improve our overall safety cultures. We have two levels. Uh, we have a light and a full. A light just gives you the data, it gives you nice graphs and say, this is what, you know, across each ingredient, this is the score you had. The full provides a full analysis as well as a path going forward or ways that you can help uh, foster or uh, cultivate a stronger safety culture. And um, some of the other things too, uh, when it comes to, and again, this doesn't necessarily relate to, and I'll wrap it up here quickly, I see the time, but this doesn't necessarily relate to our service or any service, but this is something that you can, when if you want to start looking at fostering a positive safety culture in your organization, and you wanna look at, start measuring safety culture within your organization, one of the good messages is we have to overcome this thing. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And we obviously are at the state in the industry where we're mature enough to know that, hey, if we had, didn't have an accident, we're obviously safe. We, we know that's not necessarily true. So what, what understanding and measuring your safety culture does is it gives you more insight into your organization and your shared beliefs and values about safety within the organization, which shines a light onto a lot of how that's going to affect your safety performance. And again, uh, demonstrating that return on investment. So what are some of the tangible benefits beyond safety? And we talked about it. And here's some more. There's been a link between strong safety culture and increased job satisfaction. Hey, if anything, if you don't really care about safety, especially in today's world, don't you think we want people that are happier in their job and sticking around? Well, you know, a good set, strong safety culture has been related to that, which goes into this point that there's reduced turnover intent, people wanting to leave with a strong safety culture. And that's been proven again in industry um, and different research. So if, if we really struggle with the idea, let me go back to that. If we really struggle with the idea that, okay, safety is kind of this amorphous thing, let me get some real benefits. There's two right there that a strong safety culture is related to, plus the other ones that I mentioned earlier. So real quick, real quick um, I, I know I don't, I'm gonna sound like a broken record. I don't think I really have to recap too much safety culture's impact. I, I think we all came into this presentation knowing that safety culture is a good thing that it positively impacts safety performance. Um, one of the things too, I wanted you to pick up on this too are the other aspects of safety culture and the other parts of employee behavior that it impacts such as retention, turnover intents, compliance, and the other ones that we mentioned. Uh, it is a journey to have a strong safety culture. It is not a just stick it in there and hope that it works. It is something that's continuous. And I know that sounds exhausting, like I said, but it is something that we have to stay on top of. It's something we can't just let lie. Um, and again, it's it's long-term success. It's not it's not going to be something that happens overnight. And and I I related to this earlier. Organ smaller organizations are usually a little bit more agile and which is a good and bad thing. If you get a bad leader, the, the culture can go south quickly. If you get a good leader, it can go well quickly. Bigger organizations, it can take a lot longer, um, especially as it filters down to the front line. So this is gonna be something that's long-term that we need to, uh, that we need just to buckle in and, and just keep at it. And there are any questions? I think I'll turn it over to you, Dan, if there's any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Jason. Uh, that uh, the presentation was great. Um, you you kind of already answered one of the questions we had about uh, how the size of the company affects the uh, quality of a safety program and culture. But it, part of your presentation uh, almost shocked me: the fact that uh, there are still leaders that don't really see the value of a strong safety culture. Um, how do you, if you have an influential person, doesn't need to be the, the top guy, but if you have an influential person in your organization who is not on board with a strong safety culture, how do you mitigate that? What What's the, the way to address that? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great question. So I see, I see there's maybe two categories and I don't want to make it too simplistic, but you may have a leader that has a neutral stance towards safety or safety culture where 
they're they're just so in the zone about being a strong leader and getting you know getting the numbers up and performing they may not think about it and in this case again um, being in the position that we're in and the ability to influence and ability to lead up sometimes informing that leader on the benefits of safety culture showing those tangible results uh, beyond safety even may be the spark needed for that leader to really start paying attention now if you have the leader that is toxic and hates safety kind of like that guy with the, the submarine um that's a whole different story and again we can try to influence up but in some of those cases it's just like you know what you do you i'm gonna go do me somewhere else i'm probably gonna generalize here is the lack of interest by leadership generally affected by the bottom line doesn't you know i know you talked about the return on investment you know does it take the cost of an accident to help open eyes sometimes Sometimes, unfortunately. Um, but one of the things I want to add to that, though, is even when we talk about safety management, they see it as a wet blanket, like we're going to restrict operations down to basically doing nothing risky. And that's not what safety management is about. And that's not what risk-based thinking is about. We have organizations that have an appetite for risk. Uh, we always heard the thing, no risk reward, but they go into it smartly and they mitigate the risk. And part of that idea of mitigating and addressing it is part of that behavior related to safety not just blindly going and do something because it sounds like a great idea and we can make money, but that we're going to do it, but we're going to consider how we're going to do this to reduce risk. So that we, at least we can control what we can control. Um, even companies that do embrace safety culture, they still have accidents. Is there a correlation in there? Is, you know, why do, why do companies continue to have accidents? <laughs> I wish I, man, if I knew the answer to that question, I'd, I'd be a lot <laughs> richer, but um, it, it, it is interesting. So research has shown that a strong safety culture is reduced to, or is linked to reduced incidents and accidents. It doesn't mean no incidents or accidents. And in, in a system and in the complex operations that we're doing, it's hard to say if there's any one certain thing due to safety culture or due to not having a safety management system. So it, that's a hard question to answer uh, specifically, and I don't want to skirt around it. But what I can say is having a safety management system or having a very strong safety culture does not necessarily guarantee you will never have an accident. And I know that's kind of sober, but it's, again, the nature of our high-risk industry. Well, I think that's a fair answer. Industry. You know, you, you're right. Um, accidents do happen, um, whether it's a human factor or it's a mechanical issue or something um, entirely different accidents do happen in our industry unfortunately um unfortunately for some people in an industry such as pilots you know they can follow the aviation regulations they can follow standard operating procedures they can follow the handbooks and everything else um so it's a little bit more easy to uh follow a safety culture a defined safety culture for maintenance people who are working under different conditions, um, you know, working at night, working outside, working in rain, working, um, you know, where the hangar heater is gone. Um, how, do, how do you reconcile something like that within a safety culture? Or can you? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So, um I want to be careful when I, when I speak about it, but in, in, a, in a strong safety culture with a strong shared values and beliefs about safety, that culture, again, if it's generative, looking at the next thing that go wrong, would hopefully identify those cases where, hey, you know, we've got a guy working in a 10 degree hangar, there's no heat, what that could possibly imply, or vice versa, you know, it's 150 degrees in that hangar because it's 120 outside, there's no breeze, what does that mean? And what, what do we need to do to protect our people and protect our equipment? Um, it, it, now, yes, uh, we do generally see stronger perceptions of safety culture and flight oper operations and maintenance, but that does not mean that, um, that that can't be carried over into maintenance. And again, I think it, it goes into that thinking that, hey, what do we need to do uh, and what values do we need to share so that we can protect our people and our equipment? 
Okay, let's uh, let's finish out with uh, maybe uh, maybe the easiest way to tell a summary. If there was one thing you wanted everybody in the audience to take away today, what would uh, that message be? I don't want to think it'd be one thing, but one, the importance of safety culture, which I think is already understood. Two, the importance of leadership in safety culture, not necessarily top leadership, but our, our leadership, our safety professional leadership, and that influence and the understanding of the importance of it. And then three, the that the part of fostering safety culture is one, understanding it, and two, measuring it. And don't don't I, I wouldn't take it as for granted. You know, I would take it as something that we need to pay attention as a leading metric to help describe our safety performance. Dr. Jason Sark, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, we thank you, Dan. Really appreciate the fact that you're willing to come on and share this information, that you took the time to put the presentation together to, for our audience. Um, can't tell you how much, how grateful we are that uh, you're helping to contribute thank to the safety of our industry. Well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for asking me. And um yeah, just thank you for this opportunity. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, wrap things up here. We've got a few housekeeping uh, duties that I need to address. Um, let's see if I can make sure all my computer stuff is working, find the right buttons here. And, of course, things just want to fight. There we go. Uh, save the dates. Um, our schedule may be changing, but for right now, we're still looking at trying to do uh, a couple webinars a month. Um, don't have anything set in stone right now for the first in January. Uh, topics that we are looking for are um, planning heliports and vertiports. You know, how do you identify um, as a pilot? How do you identify what's a safe heliport and vertiport to to land in? Uh, we're looking at uh, Boeing update. That one actually is scheduled for uh, into February. We uh, plan to talk about accident investigations, preventing auto rotation mishaps, and we're looking at uh, topics involving hydrogen power in rotorcraft. So we've got some interesting topics coming up. Um, HAI, we love sharing information. Uh, we just celebrated our 75th anniversary this week, yesterday as a matter of fact. And one of the principles that we've really focused on over those 75 years is uh, making information available to our industry. And in addition to webinars like this, we have strong safety programs, strong advocacy programs. We also like to share the news. Uh, a couple of things we do for sharing news is Rotor Daily. Um, some of you already received that. It's very simple to sign up for it. Um, it's free. It comes every business day to your email box. We're the ones who are doing the Google searches. We're going through the Federal Register. We're going through international sites. Try and get the information that we feel is most important to the helicopter, rotorcraft, and advanced air mobility industries around the, uh, the world. Um, the other thing we're doing, there's a special uh, kind of photo right here, the cover of the upcoming 75th anniversary edition of Rotor Magazine. Um, the cover features, uh, I think it's uh, 37, uh, I can't remember now, how many uh, magazines or how many images we have representing 18 different manufacturers that are on the cover. Um, the publication is a celebration of our industry. It's going to be an exciting in, uh, publication that will be coming to your mailbox very, very, very soon. We're looking at uh, doing a poster of the cover as well, making that available. Uh, easiest way to subscribe to Rotor Daily or Rotor Magazine, just go to rotor.org slash subscribe. Uh, you can sign up for either one or both. Uh, both of them are free. If you are living outside the United States, there is a small stipend uh, that we ask for for shipping of Rotor Magazine. Um, otherwise, we'll make sure that everything gets right sent right to your uh, inbox. We should have a feedback uh, questionnaire coming to you fairly shortly. We do ask you to take just a couple minutes to respond. Let us know things you, you would like to see us focus on. Um, if there's uh, things that we can do differently for the webinars, please listen, let us know there as well. HAI is a 75-year-old membership organization. If we'd like to think we're doing something right, but if you feel like there's something we could do better or if there's something that you need individual attention on, let us know. See if we can help you. Um, easiest way to do that is send our president and CEO, James Viola, an email. Use the email address president at rotor.org. 
He does read all of the uh, emails himself, and he does uh, either respond himself or delegate those to staff for tasking, uh, whatever makes the most sense. That does conclude our webinar for today. That also concludes our webinars for this calendar year. Uh, we know that we're into a, an annual holiday period literally around the world uh, that celebrates peace, joy, happiness, prosperity, family. We hope that uh, each of you take time or have the time to enjoy each of those uh, qualities and features. And we look forward to seeing you uh, back on HAI at Work webinars in 2024. Thank you so much.